MedCram.com. Welcome to another MedCram COVID-19 update. I wanted to show you some interesting aspects under the Critical Trends tab up here in the upper right-hand corner. And this one I found interesting, have countries flatten the curve. And you can see here is a nice diagram of the confirmed new cases in each of these countries, but they're further delineated here in scaled graphs. You can see here Brazil, United States on the right, we can see Mexico and India, and exactly what's happened here up until early June. You can see here that United Kingdom has nicely flattened the curve, whereas in Chile, it's on the other side where things are actually escalating. We can see that here also in Russia, they've been able to at least delay or hold off on further increases in the number of confirmed new cases. Canada has also done a nice job of leveling them off, whereas here in Pakistan, things seem to be accelerating. You can click on this button to view all of them. Interesting data and trends that you can see here under critical trends on the Johns Hopkins site. And of course, we'll include that link in the description below. And if we go to our friends over at Worldometer, we can also see another way of keeping track of these numbers here. You can see daily new cases for the world is actually up. Of course, there's different hot spots and cooling off spots around the world. And you can see the number of daily deaths is slowly decreasing, maybe leveling off here in late May, early June. And also, let's not forget covid-trials.org is a great website that we find that has a lot of interaction in terms of treatment and where different trials are actually being held around the world. It's listed by country, by treatment, and then different areas where you can actually follow the studies and trials with links. I wanted to talk about some risk factors for COVID-19. This article just came out yesterday. This is actually the 9th of June. And the article is titled, Diabetes May Present Greatest Risk to COVID-19 Patients When Newly Diagnosed. And this is basically data that has come out of China, which links mortality from COVID-19 to blood sugar levels. And they also compared this to their hemoglobin A1c, as you can see down here. Now, this is kind of a running average, if you will, of the amount of blood sugar in your body for the last two to three months, because we can actually measure how much glycated hemoglobin is around in your blood, which tells us how high your blood sugar levels have been for the last two to three months. What they're noticing here in this study, and we'll get to it, is that those patients with relatively low hemoglobin A1Cs, in other words, they've been under pretty good control for some period of time, come in with elevated blood sugar levels, so acutely elevated because it hadn't been that way for some time. These are the ones that are particularly at risk for mortality with COVID-19. Now, I want you to be aware, for those of you who are in the United States, the measurements of glucose here in this article are a little bit different. They're in millimoles per liter instead of milligrams per deciliter. And the way I remember that is that 10 millimoles per liter is about 180 milligrams per deciliter. And they say in this article from medwirenews.com that the size of risk increase was linked specifically to raised fasting glucose and that there was a 10.4-fold risk increase in the subgroup of patients with a fasting glucose of 7.0 millimoles per liter, which is about 126 milligrams per deciliter, but a hemoglobin A1c below 6.5%. In other words, an acute rise in blood sugar, but a hemoglobin A1c that was normal. So with that, you got a 10.4-fold risk in COVID-19. However, people who had hyperglycemia below that threshold and those with established diabetes for some period of time had a significantly increased mortality, but it wasn't as high as 104 in this group, it was only 3.29 and 4.63 fold, respectively. Now, there were some other adjustments for blood pressure medication, diabetes medication, use of corticosteroids. And this caused the authors to say that it could be speculated that COVID-19 patients with known diabetes using glucose-lowering drugs to control blood sugar might have a protective effect on the death risk. So interesting, this is a retrospective study, and so we can only say that there was an association of elevated blood sugar with increased death. We don't know if it's causation, because there could be confounders. 
I wanted to switch gears and actually highlight this Welcome Open Research article that was submitted late last month. And I thought it was an interesting article because of the question of race and mortality. Now, there's been some attention turned to that in the United States because of the published discrepancies between mortality in different racial groups. And part of the explanation of that has been directed to the ability for healthcare access. So my attention was directed to this article, which has not been completely peer-reviewed. As you can see here, it says version one, peer review, three approved with reservations. And the reason why this was an interesting article is because it's looking at race disparity in the United Kingdom, which has a national health service for all. And to the degree that this allows for open access to health care in that country, regardless of racial ethnicity, it would be interesting to see the results of that. So let's take a look. So the background here is that international and UK data suggest that Black, Asian, and minority ethnic groups are at increased risk for infection and death from COVID-19. We aim to explore the risk of death in minority ethnic groups in England using data reported by the NHS England. So how do they do that? Let's take a look at their methods. The nice thing about the NHS, of course, is that they're easily able to get data. And so they looked at deaths from the 1st of March up until the 21st of April of this year. And they standardized the data looking at the entire population of England to produce ethnic-specific standardized mortality ratios, or SMRs, for adjusted age and geographical region. And so the data here shows that the largest total number of deaths in minority ethnic groups were Indian and Black Caribbean. And that when they adjusted for region, they found a lower risk of death for white Irish and for white British ethnic groups but rather an increased risk of death for Black African, Black Caribbean, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, and Indian minority ethnic groups. And the way you read these is you look at the number initially, and it'll tell you what the risk of death is. And if it's below one, then that would imply that there is a protective effect. And if it is above one, like it is here in this case, 2.21, that would be an increased risk of death. And of course, to find out whether or not it's statistically significant, they have something called the 95% confidence interval. And generally speaking, if that confidence interval does not include the number one, then it is statistically significant. So you can see here, because the range for white British ethnic groups does not include the number one, it goes from 0.86 to 0.89, then it is statistically significantly different than a ratio of one. Here, the risk for death in black Africans is 3.24. And as you can see here, that is well above one and does not include one in that range. So that, again, is also statistically significant. For black Caribbean, once again, it's above one and the one is not included in the range and so forth. Our analysis adds to the evidence that BAME, or black Asian minority ethnic people, are at increased risk of death from COVID-19 even after adjusting for geographical region. We believe that there is an urgent need to take action to reduce the risk of death for BAME groups and better understand why some ethnic groups experience greater risk. Actions that are likely to reduce these inequalities include ensuring adequate income protection so that low-paid and zero-hour contract workers can afford to follow social distancing recommendations, reducing occupational risks such as ensuring adequate personal protective equipment, and reducing barriers in accessing healthcare and providing culturally and linguistically appropriate public health communications. And of course, I think this is all reasonable. The part that's interesting to me is that urgent need to better understand why some ethnic groups experience a greater risk. And I think there's some interesting data that is instructive on that. And it kind of takes us back to what we've been talking about here in the last couple of months, and specifically with vitamin D. I don't think that vitamin D explains 100% of the discrepancy, but I think there is a place at the table for talking about vitamin D deficiency, especially given some of the data that we've got on this. And I think this paper is pretty good in terms of this discussion because it was published four years ago, well before COVID-19 pandemic. It even has the word pandemic in the title. And the title of this article is Vitamin D Deficiency in Europe. So it's looking at the very same people in terms of population of the UK, Europe, etc. So let's see what they found in this article. 
So the purpose of this study was to apply something called the Vitamin D Standardization Program, or the VDSP protocols, to serum vitamin D data from representative childhood slash teenage and or adult, older adult European populations, representing a sizable geographical footprint to better quantify the prevalence of vitamin D deficiency in Europe. Again, this was published in 2016. So this is relatively recent. And so they did that. They took the VDSP protocols and they applied it to 14 different population studies and they looked at serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D. So this is vitamin D in the body after it gets hydroxylated at the 25 position in the liver, but just before it gets activated to its active form by hydroxylation at the one position in the kidney. So looked at that in 11 studies and complete analysis of all samples from three studies that had not been previously measured by using certified liquid chromatography, tandem mass spectrometry, and biobank serum. These data were combined with standardized serum 25-hydroxy vitamin D data from four previously standardized studies for a total N number of over 55,000 patients. Prevalence estimates of vitamin D deficiency were generated on the basis of standardized 25-hydroxy vitamin D data. So they looked at this, and what they found was that irrespective of age, irrespective of ethnic mix, irrespective of latitude of study population, it showed that 13% of the 55,000 plus European individuals had serum 25-hydroxy vitamin D concentrations less than 30 nanomoles per liter. That's the pretty low-level cutoff. There's some data that might indicate that you really want to get that level above 50, but taking a very conservative level of 30 nanomoles per liter pretty low here, and a significant amount that showed deficiency, 13%. And realize that that 13% got higher in the wintertime, up to 17.7%, and dwindled down to 8.3% in the summer months from April to November. If we go with the more robust level of 50 nanomoles per liter, then the estimate, the prevalence was a whopping 40% of subjects in the study in Europe could be considered vitamin D deficient. Let's see if there's any other breakdown. Dark-skinned ethnic subgroups had much higher, anywhere from 3 to 71-fold higher prevalence of serum 25-hydroxy vitamin D, less than 30 nanomoles per liter, than did white populations. So here is a very interesting explanation that could be applied to the study that we just looked at in terms of mortality data in COVID-19, is we have this baseline pandemic that was already there in 2016 based on the data in this study that showed that not only in general was there a significant vitamin D deficiency, quote, pandemic, but it was particularly exacerbated in dark-skinned ethnic subgroups according to this study. So now let's jump back ahead and look at some actual data that was published in mid-April of this year regarding the role of vitamin D in the prevention of coronavirus disease. And what they did in the study was pretty clever. What they decided to do was look at mortality rates of COVID-19 in certain countries and compare it to the known mean value of vitamin D in that country, in that population. And amazingly, they found a pretty good correlation. They say here in the abstract that vitamin D levels are severely low in the aging population, especially in Spain, Italy, and Switzerland. And this is also the most vulnerable group of the population in relation to COVID-19. They say here, it should be advisable to perform dedicated studies about vitamin D levels in COVID-19 patients with different degrees of disease severity. Now, in this table, you can see here the number of countries in Europe that were looked at, 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels here in this column, the cases of COVID-19 and the deaths caused by COVID-19. And we can go ahead and graph those and see what they look like. And here are those graphs. Here's the mean vitamin D level per country versus COVID-19 mortality per 1 million population. You can see in that scattergram, there is a relationship. You can also see a similar relationship here with the mean vitamin D levels per country versus COVID-19 cases per 1 million population. 
One part of this article that I found interesting is that it actually shows that the pathology of COVID-19 involves a complex interaction between the SARS-CoV-2 and the body's immune system. They say here that vitamin D, or 125-dihydroxy vitamin D, which is the active form, exerts a pronounced impact on ACE2 and angiotensin 1-7 axis with enhanced expression of ACE2. Remember, this is the receptor for the SARS virus. ACE2 is the host cell receptor responsible for mediating infection by SARS-CoV-2. From this perspective, it might be apparent that the risk of infection could be higher since you have more of these receptors. However, vitamin D has multiple roles in the immune system that can modulate the body's reaction to an infection. Abu Amr et al. have described that vitamin D deficiency impairs the ability of macrophages to mature, to produce macrophage-specific surface antigens, to produce the lysosomal enzyme acid phosphatase, and to secrete hydrogen peroxide, a function integral to their antimicrobial function. So because of these findings, it's been interesting to look in the literature about how honest scientists could disagree about whether or not we should wait for randomized controlled trials to come out to really tell us whether or not vitamin D supplementation is appropriate at this point, or whether or not we should just bite the bullet and everyone start taking vitamin D in the off chance that it might work and we get a head start on treating the population with vitamin D to reduce that high amount of vitamin D deficiency as we saw a couple of articles back. I found this article that sort of goes through that debate in terms of whether or not we should take it or not take it. Reports arguing that high dose vitamin D supplementation could treat COVID-19 are based on speculation and are a risk to public health, warns a team of scientists from across the globe. And it says here that scientists from the UK, Europe, and the United States, including experts from the University of Birmingham, have published a consensus paper in the journal BMJ, Nutrition, Prevention, and Health, warning against the use of mega doses of vitamin D for preventing or treating the virus. And they do note here that several studies published over the past couple of months have noted a link between vitamin D deficiency and COVID-19 mortality, with several concluding that daily supplementation could help reduce virus severity. But the current paper takes issue with reports concluding that doses higher than the safe upper limit of 4,000 international units per day could reduce the risk of contracting the virus and be used successfully to treat it. The report states that popular information channels such as social media platforms have been rife with misinformation that has been perpetuated by fear and uncertainty. This has been the case particularly for diet and lifestyle advice. And it notes in particular one of those articles that says consider taking 10,000 international units a day of vitamin D3 for a few weeks to rapidly raise the 25-hydroxy vitamin D concentrations, then followed by 5,000 international units per day. They go on to say that the current study warns that calls to use high-dose supplementation to treat or prevent the virus are without support from pertinent studies in humans at this time, but rather based on speculations about presumed mechanisms. And the article goes on to talk about the debate basically between starting it now versus waiting for further tests. And I think that's emblematic of the whole debate and just about everything that we're trying to treat coronavirus with. So I will leave it to you to read it and come up with your own decision. I will add one footnote, and that is that when we reviewed this a couple of years ago in the British Medical Journal, it did say that one of the things that really was an indication of how well patients would do who took vitamin D supplementation is avoiding large doses at once, and that rather it was the modest, regular dosing of vitamin D that seemed to do the best in terms of reducing acute chest infections. However, getting back to the question at hand, is there a distinction between ethnic minority groups in terms of vitamin D levels? And are they contributing to the disparity that we're seeing in mortality? Well, the way to answer that question, of course, is more studies. And if it is true, then the inherent understanding would be that we would need to check what people's levels are and customize their supplementation to their desired need. And I wanna thank you for joining us. Don't forget to check out medcram.com. Give us a thumbs up, subscribe, and hit the bell.